Should you attend a church even if you disagree with what they're teaching? Should you go to church regardless as to whether or not you believe they're teaching you the real Word of God? Hi, this is Keith Slough from Ambassador Christian College in Kannapolis. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, and I have it right in front of me here, and I'd like to read it to you. It says, We're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, and that was true then, it's true today, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We should exhort one another. That's what I do on this radio program. I talk about what is happening in the Middle East. I talk about how that they're going to be rebuilding a temple. I heard... Uh, one report that the Jews are actually planning to do it this next year. Um, I can't say for sure that's true, but you know, they've been wanting to do it for years. Only God knows when they're actually going to do it, and He's not going to allow them to do it until it's ready, until it's time. And when Jesus Christ is about ready to return, they're going to, when He's just got a short time. And I mean, I don't know if Christ is going to return in 10 years, 20 years, 30, 40, 50, I don't know. But when he's about ready to return, he's going to allow them to rebuild the temple. It's going to happen. But there are some churches that say, well, no, he's never going to rebuild the temple. I went to a prophecy seminar some years ago down here in Concord. They put these beautiful full-color brochures in your mailbox, and they invited people to come to their prophecy seminar. And the church was packed. So I went there just to hear what they had to say. And they had some good things. But... When the minister who was teaching the prophecy seminar was asked by one of the attendants, uh, do you think they're going to rebuild the, the temple in our lifetime? And his answer was, they're never going to rebuild the temple. Now, here was a guy teaching prophecy, and he doesn't understand it. He doesn't understand that the Jews will rebuild the temple. So there are churches you can go to like that that uh, make a, a lot of a lot of noise about understanding prophecy and they really don't daniel 9 27 says there's going to be a temple second thessalonians chapter 2 talks about the temple matthew 24 verse 15 when you see this abomination in the holy place where it ought not be the holy place the holy place in that day was the temple and so they're going to rebuild it now that's just one example but there are also pastors who say well the ten commandments are, are all done away one very famous preacher on television, I wonder if I should tell you his name. No, I guess I won't because there's more than one doing this, but I just happen to think of this one guy. He, he made this statement. He said, the Ten Commandments have no relationship to the Christian. No relationship. Now, if he was teaching salvation, he'd be teaching salvation by grace, and that's one thing. But once you are already saved by grace, does God expect you to start keeping the Ten Commandments? What did Jesus mean when he said in Luke 4, 4, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of God? Now, I've got the word of God, every word of it right here on my lap, from Genesis to Revelation. Jesus tells me to live by every word of it. By the way, for those of you poor, unfortunate, deceived Christians who believe the NIV is the word of God, you won't find Jesus' words in that verse. Uh because they took it out, you see. The King James is based on the original Greek, the original Hebrew and the original Greek, the Masoretic Hebrew and the Byzantine Greek, and it does have that in there. I've read it not only in the King James, I've read it in the original Greek. So Jesus said we're to live by every word of God. Luke 4 in verse 4. Every word of God. Now, you're saved by grace, yes, but then God expects you to start keeping the Ten Commandments. Where do you go to church? Let me ask you that. Where do you attend church? Now, don't write me a letter and say, oh, I go to this church or that church or the other church. I've actually had people say, my church teaches the truth, and they really believe it. But then you ask them, well, do they, do they believe in the deity of Christ? There are some cults out there today that deny the deity of Christ. Do you believe that Jesus is actually coming in the future? Do you know there's a movement called the Preterist Movement that's gaining ground in the United States that says Jesus has already returned, and he's already resurrected the dead. The Apostle Paul said there were people like that in his day. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says they're overthrowing the faith of some, and it's happening today. I asked a preterist, preterist I can't say the word, a preterist. These are people who think that the whole book of Revelation has already been fulfilled. I asked one of them one time uh, about what's going to be happening in the future. In fact, my friend and I, another friend of mine, we were asking this one guy, this preterist, and, and we knew this. We'd known this guy for some time. 
he wasn't a preterist when we met him. He was a Christian, but now, uh, like a lot of Christians, he, he was deceived. And so, actually, it was my friend who asked him the question. He said, well, if Jesus has already returned, and we're already in the millennium, or the new heavens and new earth, now, what is there to look forward to? What's going to happen in the future? And he looked at us pathetically and said, I don't know. When you ask these guys, what about that verse in Revelation chapter 1 where it says, every eye will see him? They, they say, well, that's not literal. You know, uh, there are these uh, people that knock on doors, and there's usually, they come in twos, and sometimes they have a baby on their shoulder. They're, they look so nice, and they're all dressed up, and they come, and they hand you a watchtower. And the first question I ask them is this, because they want to come in the house. And Second John the epistle of Second John says, if they don't have this doctrine, if you go up a verse, it's talking about the doctrine of Christ, don't receive them into your house. The doctrine of Christ is that God was manifest in the flesh. That's uh, Second, uh, First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. First Timothy 3.16, God was manifest in the flesh. Of course, uh, they don't believe it. Uh, but then again, the NIV doesn't believe it either because they took out the word God, though it's in the original Greek. I've also read it in the original Greek. But anyway, um, so the NIV really supports cults, by the way. If you want to be in a cult, go grab you an NIV. Don't use the King James Bible because you can't be in a cult if you believe the King James Bible. You've got to believe that every eye will see him, that Jesus is literally coming back, that he's literally going to stand on this earth, according to Zechariah 14, verse 4. But these people come and they, they knock on your door and I say, well, I got one question. Do you believe in the deity of Jesus Christ? And they're, they're honest. They'll look at you and say, uh, well, no, there's only one God and that's Jehovah. And I say, yeah, there is one God, but do you know what the Hebrew word for God is? They don't know. It's Elohim, meaning a group, one God group, one God family, one God head. The Bible in our King James Bible uses the word God head about three times. There is more than one person who make up God, but they don't know the Greek. They don't know the Hebrew. They, they know what the uh, Watchtower Society tells them. Bless their hearts. And I don't, I don't dislike these people. I just wish that, that uh, God would open up their hearts and minds to understand the Word of God. But they have to get rid of their Bible and go back to using the King James. And by the way, if you're using the NIV, do you know the NIV and the Jehovah's Witness Bible? Because they had to rewrite the Bible. They had to write their own version in order to support their doctrines. Do you know the NIV is almost identical? Or at least more so than any of the other new versions? It's just the, the Jehovah's Witnesses, if they ever get rid of their Bible, they'll use the NIV. Ah, uh, dear me. Well, anyway, where do you go to church? Now, there was a story told. It's probably apocryphal. This fellow was talking to his barber one day. He said, I'm really mad at our church. And, and the barber said, why? He said, well, we've got a small Baptist church, and uh, we don't have enough members to, to hire a pastor. And there's a church up the street called the Christian Church, or Disciples of Christ. They don't have enough money to hire a pastor either. So our deacons got together with their board, and we decided to join our churches together. That way we'd have enough money to hire one pastor. And the barber said, well, what's wrong with that? He said, well, we call ourselves Baptists. That's what we are, and they call themselves Christians. And uh, they decided that since we're going to be one church, we can't be Baptist anymore. We're going to have to just call ourselves uh, Christians. He said, I've been a Baptist all my life. He said, my granddaddy was a Baptist. My daddy was a Baptist. He said, and I've been a Baptist for 50 years. And I'm telling you right now, ain't nobody going to make a Christian out of me. Well, I know what he meant. I think you know what he meant, too. Where do you go to church? The Bible says we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Now, there are people all the time that are looking around for a church that teaches more or less what they have to offer. I got a letter some time ago from a fellow in Germany who had been listening to us over uh, short, shortwave radio over there, and he said, do you have a church that teaches what you're teaching? And unfortunately and sadly, I had to tell him, no, we don't have anybody over there yet that started a church. I began writing to pastors asking them if I could send some of our radio listeners to their churches, pastors that at least came close to what, what you hear on this radio program. Now, I've been on the radio now for over 30 years, and I want to tell you, God has revealed a lot of truth to me in those years. In fact, I've been in the Word of God studying it diligently for over half a century. And you hear things, if you're a regular listener, you know for a fact that you hear things on this program that you have not heard anywhere else. 
and I'm not going to go into it now because I want to have it just four more minutes to, 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 to spend with you. But so many things, and it comes right out of that old King James Bible. People say, you know, wonder what kind of Bible he's using, the King James. Like the three days and three nights that Christ was in the tomb. How did he die on Friday and he rose on Sunday morning? That's just one example there. If you don't know what I'm talking about, well, why don't you come sometime? We have a service on Saturday morning. Uh, we have tried uh, to start a church from our graduates, but they all have their own churches. And maybe you're looking for a church. I've actually had people to call me and say, I'm looking for a church in my area. Uh, do you have one here that I could attend that, that teaches the way you do? And so I've gotten more than one letter about that, and I have to say, no, we don't have a church there. We do have a small fellowship in Kannapolis. It meets on Saturday morning. We start at 1030 sharp, and uh, we live stream it for people outside of the state of North Carolina and even other countries. We've had over a 1,000 people in Pakistan watching. We've got, I don't know how many hundreds in Poland, and even South America, people in Brazil watching our, uh, our live uh, messages and we're, we actually don't have a church per se. It's really more of a Bible study, and yet we're planning to start a church. We're small. If you'd like to come, you'll be invited. Now, we're non-denominational, and I know some of you are died in the wool, whatever, Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, Lutherans, or uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, or Mormons, or whatever you happen to be. But maybe you have an open mind, and you're thinking, well, let me just check this out. I'm, I'm going to find out. I've done that. I have visited everything from Methodist to Presbyterian to... What have I not gone? I've, I've been to Lutheran, and I even visited a few Catholic services. One time I visited a Jehovah's Witness service. A friend of mine had invited me to go, and a couple of times, two or three times, I went to a Mormon uh, service and found they were serving water in their communion service. Interesting. So I visited different types of churches uh, over the years, Assemblies of God, of course, and other Pentecostal charismatic groups and so on. But uh, there are always people that are, that are looking into the Bible, and sometimes they don't really agree with everything that they're being taught, and they wonder, is there more? So you're invited. And let me tell you this. You don't have to wear a suit. We have no dress code. Come as you are. Come casual. I do strongly encourage you to bring a King James Bible because that's the one we're going to be using. And uh, we don't even pass a plate. We are the only church that I know of in this area. In fact, the whole state of North Carolina. I don't know of another one that does not pass the plate. We put a box back there for people who want to help us out, help us with our ministry. It takes uh, money to be on radio and to do the publishing we do. It takes uh, money to keep our college open. And we, if we didn't have the tithes and offerings from God's people, we couldn't keep that open. So we put a box in the back, but nobody's going to put a plate under your nose and obligate you. Nobody's going to do that. If you want to give, fine. If you don't want to give, fine. Just bring a Bible. Bring you a Bible. Bring your family with you. We don't have a you know, school for the kids or anything like that now. If we get enough people coming regularly, uh, we have had that in the past. So <clears throat> people are transient. We've had, we had one uh, family that had a nice-sized family that they moved to Arizona. That happens. We would like to invite you to come. We meet at the college, 1501 South Main Street. That's where we're meeting now. Now, if you hear this played back a year or two years from now, it might be different. So here's the telephone phone number to call uh, just to make sure we're there. And uh, that's where we're meeting right now as I'm doing this program. We have been there for years and years, but we never know because we are leasing the building. One of these days, God will bless us where we can actually own our own building, and that would be nice. One of these days. So we're, the, the name of our ministry is Christian Fellowship Ministries. Uh, I want to be honest with you. We are not charismatic, but we do believe in a literal understanding of the Holy Bible. Christian Fellowship Ministries, and it's at 1501 South Main Street in Kannapolis. Here's the telephone number to call for more information, 704-938-6415. That's 704-938-6415. We are strictly non-denominational and very, very, very Bible literalist. I mean, we take the Bible ultra literally. We'd like for you to come. Until next time, from Ambassador Christian College, this has been Keith Slough.